Buenos días a todos y a todas. Uh, good afternoon, bonjour, bon día. Bienvenidos y muchas gracias por acompañarnos en este acto que da inicio a la séptima edición del Día Internacional de la Ciudad Educadora. Eh, nos acompaña el presidente delegado de la, de la asociación, eh, Pau González Val, eh, también concejal de Educación del Ayuntamiento de Barcelona, eh, que abrirá formalmente eh, este acto. Pau, adelante, tienes la palabra. Muchísimas gracias, Marina. Uh, es un auténtico placer poder abrir este, este acto, como, como siempre, un año más, eh, este espacio de de compartir entre ciudades y de aprender uh, muchísimo unos de otros y sobre todo también de los, eh, de los invitados o invitadas como hoy en el caso de, de Valerie. En primer lugar, muchísimas gracias a, a todas las personas que hoy nos uh, acompañan en este, en este acto. Uh, tanto los, que, los panelistas, digamos, como también... Eh, las ciudades interesadas also, en este en este, en este uh, trabajo en red, en este in this, uh, intercambio de network, en este exchange of experiences. Eh, decía, tanto, nos ayuda pues, as I said, a, a aprender, a avanzar, helping us to learn in advance, and so that we can no continue to be atrás, cities that leave no one behind. Ciudades de paz, de oportunidades, cities of peace and opportunity, el, el lema de, as de, we see este in the, uh, this year's motto. Mañana es el día internacional de la ciudad de Tomorrow Barcelona. is the International Day of Education Cities. Centenares de ciudades. The cities of all over the world, hundreds of them, are going to be celebrating our, uh, this uh, day at a local level. But it's also very important to draw attention to the activities taking part in these cities. We need to have this uh, meeting space. We know that education is something that is built, for, is made by all of us, and it's for all of us. It's such an important uh, task. Bajo responsabilidad Too important to be left just to the uh, educating institutions. It's a community project. It's about the city, it's about families. It's about uh, children, young people, it's about uh, everyone in society. We all need to be involved in this local and uh, worldwide improvement of education so that we can have a, a, a community meeting place. Y lo que es, uh, lo que es evidente, y eh, había un pedagogo reconocido uh, catalán, no, que es un uh, catalán um, pedagogo, uh, 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 to change uh, cities uh, through education, to, to make them places of peace. Of, uh, and peace is not just the absence of violence, it's uh, the absence of all forms of violence. Education is and must be the foundation from which we face up to new challenges. Now there are challenges throughout the world that need to be faced up to, and uh, at the moment we're going through a context of war. There's a war in the heart of Europe, and there are 
cuesta mucho wars pero around the world. Guerras, eh, que tenemos This ahora is something we forget about in Europe sometimes. And so it's absolute duty to esta, think about decía, how we can improve an education to foster non-violence and to uh, foster respect for human rights. So educating for peace is about living together, it's about diversity, the great diversity amongst uh, in cities and, and diversity is a great source of wealth. It's certainly not a threat, so on the contrary, it's, uh, it makes our societies richer. We need to create empathic and critical educational spaces and help young people to relate to themselves and relate to the environment and the rest of the world. So we believe that social justice, equality, cooperation and solidarity are basic values that lie at the heart of education in cities. Somos una ciudad refugio, una ciudad We're, Barcelona is a refuge city. We always show solidarity. During the war in the Balkans, District 11 of Barcelona uh, built uh, bridges of solidarity to Sarajevo. And we've always wanted to be a city of refuge for people fleeing war or famine or cl the climate emergency or any uh, person fleeing from very difficult situations. So we feel morally obliged to show solidarity and to build these uh, spaces for, uh, for, for common living in exchange. We're asking for a lot of efforts to be made, of course. It's not just schools that we need to build this society. We have to change the world, and we can't just do it through education, but education is one of the most fundamental uh, tools uh, in, in changing the world for the better. Oh, to, to conclude, education in young people and children is fundamental, but we also need to train people throughout their lives. It's lifelong learning. So we need to continue to ask questions and provide solutions, and we need to learn throughout our lives. So education is a bubble for young people, but not only. Now, as we feel this greater proximity, this allows us to be more committed. As I said, this is too important to just do it alone. That's why it's so important to have these uh, spaces for learning. And we're going, we'll, uh, we can learn from each other. So without further ado, I'd like to thank you once again. I'd like to uh, thank all of you who've made this event possible today and who've created this, this concept of an innovating city, which it's, it's a city, cities where there's a, a quality of opportunity, social quality, and uh, so thank you very much. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I will now give the floor to our first guest, Valerie Hannon. Um, she will be invited to, uh, to share with us her vision on, and reflections uh, about uh, what do we educate for. Uh, after her presentation, we will have the opportunity to have the testimony of two member cities um, that will focus on this year's uh, celebrations uh, slogan. Uh, an educating city is a city of peace and opportunities, as Mr. Chairman was saying. And uh, we know that you are all, all of you are passionate about education and its transformative power, but we will ask you to stick to the time and to keep uh, help us keeping the schedule. Um, I will now introduce you, Valerie Hannan. Um, she is a former second ed education 
teacher. She has been advisor to the uh, um, British government uh, in the field of learning and creativity. She has also been uh, an advisor uh, to the OECD uh, in innovative learning and environments. But she, most of all, she is an activist. She is the author of several books and uh, always um, around innovation. This has been the core of her activity. Um, Valerie, uh, I give you the floor and we will listen to, to your presentation very attentive. Thank you very much for joining us in this celebration. Marina, thank you very much indeed. And thank you, Chairman Pao, for the preface that you gave us to today's conference, which I thought set precisely the right tone and indeed anticipates uh, much of what I have to say to the audience today. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining this. It's um, an inspiring title and an, a, an extraordinarily important theme, I believe. I've, I suppose I've devoted my life to it in a sense. Um, and today, what I'd like to do is very much focus on the question of purpose. Um, but I'm going to locate that in a, a broader landscape of some global uh, phenomena or changes that I see arising across the world. I'm very fortunate to be able to work internationally um, on every continent. And I think what we're witnessing now in relation to learning, education, and the state of our planet is indeed a global dialogue. And I think that you are contributing to that. So I've called my talk, What Do We Educate For? Education in the 21st Century. And I wanna start with that because it seems to me that there are three trends that I see globally that I would like to put in before this conference. That we are looking now to transform education and not just improve it or reform it. And in service of that agenda, I see three trends. The first is this new debate about purpose, which I'm going to spend some time on. It's a really, really important debate. The second, at institutional level, particularly the school systems, which, as Powell remarked, are at the heart of this, but they cannot do it alone, are a set of design principles to create schools that are fit for the future. Not just replicating what we've had in the past, but actually starting from some basic principles of design of powerful learning environments that are fit for the 21st century and for that new purpose that we're driving towards. And then thirdly, and this is very much speaking to the theme of um, education within cities and cities' role, is the intentional, deliberate creation of local learning ecosystems to support future fit learning. So those are my three trends, and I'm going to speak to each of them in turn. And the first speaks of this question, what is the purpose of most education systems? Why do they exist? And this is a question which is not often asked because the answer is taken for granted. It is assumed that we all know, of course, obvious, why we must have educated populations. But is it really? I would like to pose the question somewhat differently, but begin by setting out what I think is the underpinning education story which currently prevails in most systems. It's fundamentally individualistic, it's competitive, and it's economistic. And I think there are six propositions that underpin this public narrative or this public story about education. The first is that education gets invested in because it makes nations more prosperous, because it increases growth. growth usually measured by GDP, gross domestic product. And of course, that ignores the fact that infinite growth is impossible on a planet with finite resources. One of the scourges of our age, I would want to argue, and many economists make this point now, is that growth is really problematic. But yet, we lurch forward wanting more and more growth. Second, education is the route to the best jobs. And third, education is the route to social mobility. Individualistic aims, which give advancement to individuals. 
The fourth is that success in education is really about getting qualifications. You know, in the rhetoric, you will sometimes hear things about character formation or creating citizens, but actually success is really getting qualifications. And subject-based academics are the qualifications that really matter because vocational qualifications are everywhere seen as second class. And thirdly, getting into university is a key success indicator. If you haven't got a degree, then really you're second class. Now, when you set it out like that, this is a pretty ugly narrative. And not many people would say, yeah, I agree with all of that. But the truth is that that is the narrative which prevails and which underpins most of the politics of education. And it is because of that narrative that many educators, whether in school, education, or in lifelong learning, find themselves really constrained by the old assumptions about how education should be conducted, what the curriculum should be, and how it should be assessed. So we have to call out this narrative for what it is and say, really, is that what we want for the 21st century? I think we need a new narrative for education and one that starts with our purpose. What do we want? I've tried to set this out in a book which was published a couple of years back by Oxford University Press, Cambridge University Press, sorry. It's called Thrive, The Purpose of Schools in a Changing World. And in it, we suggest that we need a new and very explicit purpose which is that today education has to be about learning to thrive in a transforming world. And notice, please, the change of language. We don't talk about success. We're talking about thriving, a very deliberate biological metaphor, because it invites the question, well, what does it mean to thrive? But before you get there, you have to ask the question, a transforming world? Isn't it just the same as ever in the sense that we have always had change? If you had lived in the 15th century or the 17th century, you would have said, ah, oh, so much change. It's unbelievable the speed of change. Well, I would argue that the evidence that we have about trends at this part in the 21st century means that we are living in a unique epoch a set of changes which have never been witnessed by humanity before. And we have some good evidence about the coming 30 years, which suggests that the changes that humanity now faces are unique and unprecedented, and we must focus on them in our education systems. So what does the evidence tell us? Well, it suggests that there are three major tipping points or pivots that will distinguish this century, which humanity has never faced before. Bear that in mind, never. The first is around our planet. The second is around the apotheosis of technology, the raising of technology to godlike status and our own evolution as humans. I'm going to very briefly talk about each of those tipping points or pivots in human history. The first is that our planet is at a tipping point. And there are three strands to this, which are combining to lead us to a future we know not where. The first is the sixth great extinction. The second is our entry into the Anthropocene age. And the third is the climate crisis. Now I don't have time to spend a great deal of time on all of these, but let me just very briefly mention, firstly, the destruction of biodiversity, which often takes place at a secondary level to the climate crisis and global warming. It should not, because it is as important and directly destructive as that of the impact on the, climate, on the planet's warming. The UN latest report said, the essential interconnected web of life on Earth is getting smaller and increasingly frayed, it's a direct result of human activity and constitutes 
a direct threat to humans' well-being in all regions of the world. And unless we reverse this, we will not survive as humans. The second one, I hardly need to rehearse with this audience. You all are fully aware of the urgency and the seriousness of the climate crisis that we face. We have just held a COP in Egypt with what many people would describe as deeply, deeply disappointing results. There is a new movie, or maybe it's not all that new, which you may have seen called Don't Look Up. Um, I don't know if you've seen it, but I think it's out on general release. It's got Meryl Streep and Leo DiCaprio in it. And it's got these scientists who discovered that there is heading towards us um, uh, a, a, a foreign being, uh, which is about to smash into Earth with extinction level results. They know when it's gonna happen. Three months, six days, four hours. They can plot its path towards us. And they are saying, look, it's coming. We've got to change. We've got to do stuff, quick. And people are saying, oh yeah, hmm, that looks bad. Right, let's talk about the latest soap opera or who's gonna win the World Cup. Don't look up. And I would suggest that we has, as educators must look up and make these crises absolutely central to what it is that we are doing. So the second pivot point in human history is around technology in control. And here there are three strands also leading to a future we know not where. The first is job disruption by robotics. The second is the penetration of artificial intelligence into every aspect of human life. And the third, a really, really positive development is global connectivity. Again, I don't have time to talk of each, each of these in turn, but just very briefly, let me start with that third one, global connectivity. Because if I sound as though everything is catastrophic, I don't mean to, but we must bear in mind that we now live at a point in history, sometimes described by uh, scientists and scholars as big mind, in which every mind can rapidly be connected to other minds in the world. This big mind through digital technology and connectivity means that, for example, the vaccine for COVID was invented in a fraction of the time which was anticipated. Why? Because every scientist was able to connect their results, their data sets, their experimental methods with others. Big Mind enabled this. This has never happened in human history before. And its consequences for learning are immense. Let me just talk of one other shift in technology. We are entering no ordinary disruption as far as the labor market and the future of work is concerned. Again, this has got to be of massive interest to educators. Never before have we invented a technology which can almost get to the point of reinventing itself. And no ordinary disruption, this book by McKinsey's, shows that it will impact on almost every aspect of our working lives and fields of labor. We need to be conscious of this as we go forward and it has never happened in human history before. This is my refrain. The third pivot point or inflection point in history is our impact on ourselves as humanity. For the first time through genetic engineering, through the convergence of human bodies with artificial intelligence and through human enhancement technologies, HETs, we are almost intervening in our own evolution as a species. Never happened before. So in terms of genetic engineering, we are at the point where trait selection for infants or for babies in the womb is becoming a huge benefit because we can engineer out um, inherited terrible diseases, but we can also engineer in some choices about the children that we bear. So whilst this is a kind of joke, these are just samples of design, actually in China, we know that in some laboratories, this is exactly what is going on, trait selection. So there you have it, three 
pivot points in history. Let me just add one more on this issue of uh, our own evolution. The linkage of our own brains directly to the web. At the moment, we have to pick this up. It's never far from us because we start to get anxious and hyperventilate if our second brain is too far away. Soon, you won't have to pick it up. You will have an implant. And if you don't believe me, look at what Neuralink, just one of the companies, is doing in this field to think about how we get direct connectivity between brains and the net. Well, I hope you will agree that these are no ordinary changes. What we're actually looking at, the age of hyperchange and disruption, humanity at a new point in its history. And it becomes clear that your children and your learners' lives will be impacted by these change forces, by climate crisis, by the loss of biodiversity, by job disruption, by robotics, what is known as the fourth industrial revolution, by artificial intelligence, by global connectivity, genetic engineering, something I haven't mentioned yet, probably more pandemics. Do you think that you have seen the last of the pandemics? Most scientists do not. And of course, as Powers mentioned right at the top of this talk, growing inequality, violence and conflict, which we had hoped might have been eliminated from our planet, but far from it. So that is the transforming world. Now, if we have to learn how to thrive in that transforming world, that is very different from the old ideas of success. So what might success look like? Well, I would argue that schooling systems today are currently entirely inadequate for addressing the scale of our challenges. Learners are not acquiring the knowledge, the skills, the values needed for the 21st century era, nor are they appreciating the imperative of becoming lifelong learners. We might offer opportunities, or might not, but do people take them? People can pass exams, or some can, but are they learning how they will thrive? And this is where I think we need to substitute a new purpose for learning. And I'm not alone. So this is not a voice crying in the wilderness. If you look at any one of these recent publications, the most recent being this UNESCO document, Reimagining Our Futures Together, you will find set out a similar argument to the one that I've just put in front of you. And indeed, for the first time, the UN convened a summit not on improving education, but on transforming it in September of this year. And you will see there that they remarked at the end that the crisis in education requires us to fundamentally rethink our purpose and change. I won't read it all out because you can see for yourself. Well, if we need to transform, and if we are now to talk about thriving and not success, how do we conceive of thriving? I want to offer to you the following thought, that if we are to think about thriving in the next 30 years, something like this should help us think about it. We need to consider thriving at four levels, which are completely interrelated. The first is thriving at the planetary or the global level, because unless our, our planet thrives and does well, we are toast. We have had it. We have no home. And unless globally we have a thriving, peaceful set of interconnected cultures and communities and societies, the same is true. Second level down is we live in communities, whether it's in cities or rural communities, in society. And we need to thrive at societal level. So what does a thriving society look like? In my book, I argue from the evidence that the thriving societies are not the richest, not the most prosperous. The most thriving societies are actually the societies which I'm sorry, I'm hearing some background noise here. I think someone needs to mute. The societies which thrive are those which 
are most equitable. Whatever their resources, they distribute their resources most equitably, which is an incredibly important finding. The next level down is thriving interpersonally, our relationships. So how do we create thriving interpersonal relationships between us as humans? And the fourth, of course, is the personal level. How do you thrive in your body, in your mind, in your soul? How do you begin, become someone with great mental health who knows how to um, become someone who can make a contribution, but most of all, is calm and purposeful in herself, in her sense of identity. Well, I've offered those four levels of thriving and around the world there are schools, there are institutions who are intent upon substituting the purpose of thriving to that of success, that of academic success. And I wanted to share some of those with you today in the time that I have left. What do schools look like that are setting out to be fit for the future? enabling young people to thrive. Well, in my research for this book called Future School, um, I discovered across the world a set of schools who were indeed heading out to thrive. And it was a very interesting charge I was given in terms of the research for the book, because if you were asked, what does the school fit for the future look like? I wonder how you would go about researching it. The methodology was difficult. So I didn't start with schools. I started with a set of organizations which were studying the future. And here are those future-focused organizations. You can see what they are. Some of them are uh, intergovernment organizations. Some of them are think tanks. Some of them are philanthropists. But all of them were saying, okay, what can we say with some confidence leaving aside the asteroid, of course, <laughs> that might hit us, you know, wild cards that we cannot anticipate. What do we know about the future? And from that view, these organizations had distilled some principles for education institutions, how a future fit organization ought to look. And my research team and I synthesized them into a group of design principles. Um, usually when people think about setting up a new school, they think about curriculum, pedagogy, and assessment. And we found that these schools did not start there. They start with design principles, and then they derive their curriculum and assessment from those principles. Well, to be clear what we mean by a design principle, it's interpreted as a law with leeway. In other words, it has some flexibility, but it gives you a guidance, it gives you a direction. What were the design principles that we found? Well, we found that there were three categories, if you like, of design principles, not curriculum, pedagogy and assessment, but the design principles were groups of values, groups of operational philosophy, and groups of design principles around the learner experience. And this last one is very, very interesting because in the past, schools have been designed not with learner's experience in mind, but mostly with the expectations of a curriculum or the needs of teachers. And for the 21st century, we have to look at how the learners are experiencing all of this as a design principle. So very briefly, let me share with you what these design principles are. The first cluster, design principles in values. And we found five. Schools choosing to change, to transform, to become fit for the future, first of all, set out with a very explicit purpose. They are purpose-driven. They don't leave it silent. They don't just talk about success or meeting your potential, they are explicit about their purpose. Second, they put equity right at the heart of what they are doing. They are equity focused. Thirdly, they promote identity. So they are saying, we are in the business. This is our value to enable people to find their identity, to enable communities to find identity. And I think that this is a uniquely 21st century 
preoccupation, which interests me a lot. The fourth design principle is that they set out to be strength-based. In other words, they're not just remedying deficits or failures in their young people, they are setting out to find their strengths and build upon those strengths. And finally, they are relevant. They are saying we as schools must be relevant to our society and to the big issues that confront humanity. And it is that, of course, which motivates young people so profoundly. So that was the set of design principles we found around values. The next set of design principles was around operational philosophy. And of course, this is where you do derive your curriculum, your pedagogy, and your assessment. And there were four that we found. The first is that these schools are learning focused. Now, that may seem to you to be absolutely obvious. I'm afraid it is not. Because what it means is that these institutions focus on learning to ensure that all the new findings from research, from the learning sciences, from neuroscience, are put into practice in their schools. They don't just do what they did last year or the year before. They are alert to new ways of teaching, new ways of learning, and really putting into practice, implementing the best knowledge there is about how powerful learning is enabled. The second design principle is around flexibility and dynamism. Again, they are prepared to change what they do. And you found this very much in evidence during COVID. The future fit schools could change like that to become users of technology in creative and different ways to continue with the learning. And in my book, you will see examples of schools who hardly missed a beat when they moved into COVID because they were so flexible in the ways in which they taught and which their children could learn. The third principle is that they are technology enhanced. They will use any form of technology that they can lay their hands on to power learning, but they're not driven by the technology. And this is a very important difference. They are enhanced by it. And their technology might be the most updated augmented reality or virtual reality, or it might be simply using Zoom, or it might be using paintbrush. So any form of technology that enhances learning is utilized. And the final one, very relevant to today's conference and where I'm going to end my talk, is that they are ecosystemic. In other words, they recognize that they cannot do everything alone that they need to embed their efforts as a school with all the opportunities for learning, whether in a city or in a different kind of community that can be brought to bear and explicitly and intentionally create an ecosystem of learning. I'm gonna come back to that point, but I think it is a very interesting design principle for schools of the future. And then finally, I've said that unless all of this is experienced differently by learners, it counts for nothing. And we found in our research that there are five design principles, and this seems to have slipped somewhat in the translation, but I will uh, try to make it clear, around learning experience. The first is that learning needs to be personalized. Learning is not something that can be delivered like a package to a class full of 30 young people with happens, who happen to be 15 or happen to be 12. They're all at different ages or stages. And personalization, I think, is one of the great developments of the 21st century learning, and which is enabled hugely by digital technology too. The second design principle is that learning needs to be integrated, by which is meant subjects are not seen in silos, but rather the relationships between, say, science and art, between the humanities and perhaps physical education are explicitly brought out. And through this, meaning is created and learning becomes much more meaningful to learners. The third design principle is that learning should be experienced as inclusive. Learners feel welcome, they feel included, whoever they are, wherever they're from, 
whatever their background, whatever their neurodiversity, they are felt to be part of this community. And in the research, I have to say, this was one of the most inspirational things we found, looking at schools who work in this way, profoundly moving. It is very different from the past. And it's related to the fourth design principle. Learning is experienced as social and relational. This is an understanding that stretches back as far as Aristotle, but we have individualized it to our loss. So in these institutions, learners experience learning as collaborative, as mutually supportive, as a profoundly social activity. And finally, they experience learning as empowering. They feel that as a result of the learning they do, they are a stronger person. They experience learner agency and have a sense that they can make a difference to the world. And surely coming back to your chairman's introduction to this talk, that is what we need to be encouraging. Young people who feel that they can not just endure the future, but shape the future. So those were the design principles. That's the second change in the world that I'm observing. And finally, I want to take you to the third trend that I have observed, the growth of local learning ecosystems. And I touched on that as one of the design principles that schools who are trying to transform for the future have taken in, that they want to be part of something bigger than themselves, looking beyond their four walls, looking before, beyond just the teaching staff that they have. And the notion of ecosystems, learning ecosystems, is really one that's growing. Um, everyone will have my slides after this, so you're welcome to delve into this a little more, particularly through these two organizations, Knowledge Works and Education Reimagined, who've published a great deal recently on what an ecosystem for learning looks like. And I, with my research team, uh, published this report uh, a few years back called Local Learning Ecosystems Emerging Models. And we're just in the new phase of that research, looking at what that looks like in the global south, because most of our examples in this report were actually in the global north. I'm going to talk about a couple of them in a minute. So what do we mean by a local learning ecosystem? Well, we mean that Different four types of, 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 of or, or, um, members of society and organizations join together, not just in formal partnerships, but in really profoundly connected ways to enable learning to be empowered and available to everyone of all ages. Notice schools are not at the center. They are one other of a whole range of partners. What is the feature of an ecosystem? An ecosystem is defined by its diversity, its diversity. And so it's not just schools and colleges linking or schools, colleges and universities. It's all kinds of organizations, all parts of civil society who recognize that they have a role to play in connected learning. And again, Pao in his introduction remarked on this, every education has to be everyone's business everyone's business. And I find it really extraordinary the kinds of new models that are growing up in terms of thinking ecosystemically and not just thinking about institutions. But to do that, schools have to be redesigned. They cannot be left in the old 20th century model. They must transform along with the rest of society. Let me give you two examples for you to follow up after this talk. The first is Remake Learning, which is based in Pittsburgh, in Pennsylvania, a really remarkable organization. Notice the title. They don't want to improve learning. They want to remake it. And it started in Pittsburgh, Steel City, which was post-industrial at that point, back in 2007. And in 2007, they had the idea what if we connect up schools and university and museums and government and libraries and business and funders and nonprofits in a really powerful network to provide new and diverse opportunities for learners? By the time you get to 2017, the network is so diverse 
and so populated and so thick, it is hardly capable of being um, counted. There are the data, I won't read them out. You can see how extraordinary these ecosystems of learning have now become. And I really encourage you to look at Remake Learning's website because what they are doing in terms of engagement of communities and all sectors of societies with the schools seems to me to be an absolute model for how the future looks. And there, as you can see, they remark that learners are connected across all the places they live, work and play. And as you can see, a whole range of places are envisaged and they're growing all the time. Their motto is no one organization alone can transform teaching and learning to better serve today's young people. And Remake Learning helps bring them together. And to come closer to home, let me give you another example of Educatio 360, um, which many of you will know, based in Barcelona, which is a, a, a program of the Jaume Bofill Foundation. It is interesting how often philanthropists and funding organizations intervene in education systems to try to bring about this connectivity. And Education 360, through the Jaume Beaufil Foundation, has done just this, connected local authorities, civil society, hospitals, the army, the police, youth organizations, you name it, any kind of organization which can offer learning opportunities is signed up to create a much richer tapestry or repertoire of learning opportunities and make them exciting and motivational. So let me, in finishing now, give you my conclusions. Education, I believe, is literally humanity's only hope. Again, Powell touched on this with the specific dimension of peace at the heart of what he said. But I hope I've said enough to show that there are other issues other pivot points, not just conflict and uh, absence of it, which are confronting humanity in a completely new way. And education is, or learning, is society's only hope. But its purpose must be resought for these 21st century conditions. We can't go on with the old ideas about purpose. Thirdly, schools are vital to the task but only if they are redesigned. And we now know how. We now know how to do it. Fourthly, the redesign must include a move towards learning ecosystems, not learning silos, engaging all aspects of communities, whether they are cities, whether they are semi-urban, semi-rural, wherever you live, the creation of learning ecosystems, including, by the way, technologically enables so that you can be in a learning ecosystem with Harvard or MIT or Oxford or wherever. Drawing into your own community all the resources for learning that the world has available. Next, again to quote Powell, education has to become everybody's business. That is our task. And I finish by saying, we can do this. I finished there. Thank you so much for listening. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, Valerie. Gracias por compartir Thank you el análisis for sharing with us your proposals, your analysis of the situation, and you wound up on an optimistic note. We are facing tremendous challenges, but since we now know how, we can rise to these challenges. A very stimulating presentation. Thank you, enabling us to think about education and how to enhance it on the basis of specific proposals and how to uh, modify our approach regarding uh, world economic growth and we try and thrive we try and foster thriving on a personal level rather than uh, making the economy grow through education and you spoke also of ways in which the education system although it's entered the 21st century is still far too close to our 20th century model you refer to this, Valérie, and this 
ha sucedido, sino que además been ya change, no, eh, sucede but, eh, más rápido y uh, estamos ya en change in society and changes eh, in on our planet are speeding up eh, and things are becoming increasingly irreversible. So we need to transform our education at the same time as our world is being transformed. And you also said we need to uh, be based upon our values and a new uh, educational philosophy. And you also spoke at the end of your speech about the way we need to remake, to redesign schools so that they don't stand alone items, as it were, but integrated into society and how we need to integrate technology uh, and civil society into what schools are doing. Yo creo que uno de los mejores ecosistemas I think educativos that in the face of the silos to which you referred, one of the best learning ecosystems that are available to us is uh, cities, educating cities when it comes to improving education. Thank you very much, Valérie. Fascinating presentation. We can turn now to the next part of our desde la experiencia concreta de dos event. ciudades eh, miembros del, de, we'll la, de la ICE, about poder eh, conocer estas, estas, from nuevas, of uh, estas propuestas de, de, de cambio de la educación de la educación de la educación de las personas que habitamos hoy en día y a futuro el mundo eh, merecemos. Tenemos Changing el placer in such a way that we adapt to what the world deserves. We have the good fortune to have Luisa Moret with us. She's mayoress of um, uh, de Llobregat. And bon dia, Luisa. Gracias por ser con nosotros. San Boy de Llobregat and chair of the Education Com Commission of the Barcelona, uh, digamos, del área metropolitana de Barcelona, of the Federation. Y que cuenta con unos 85.000 habitantes. San Boy has around 85,000 inhabitants and is very close to Barcelona. There's one quite urban part of Sant Boy de Llobregat and also a more rural part. And it's interesting because in the ámbito del trabajo de la how, uh, salud, uh, sensitive and aware they are there about work in the areas of mental health they have um, authoritative voices in that area and they've, uh, they've been founder members of our association we will also be hearing about the experience of munich the capital of bavaria germany through karina miklos thank you Karina for coming. She's a coordinator of uh, all European projects. And the population of Munich is over one and a half million persons. It's a major economic center. And the local government is fostering uh, high tech and uh, biotechnology companies. More than 50% of the children in Munich uh, come from a migration background. Munich's been a member of our association for uh, many years now. Thanks to both of those cities, San Boy and Munich, for being represented here. We do need to have a cool, calm look at things, as Valerie has said, but it's important that we hear from these cities that have been trying to uh, bring about transformation in education already. So we'll start now with San Boy. Uh, they have experienced that uh, with uh, projects for peace and good coexistence. So you have the floor, please, Luisa Moret. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be able to take part in this event. As Pau has said, this is a very useful initiative to share views 
entre instituciones among all those involved and those of us who share this commitment to changing our paradigm and having better education cities. And in St. Boy, we've been at this for years. We've become, uh, uh, we've tried to link education actively and strategically into all of our uh, urban policies. We think it's a transversal thing affecting all of our other policies. And that's something I'd like to stress at this time. We try to be coherent and having belonged to education, educating cities from the word go has enabled us to keep up with what's going on and to integrate any education into any public policy because any public sector policy that's brought online by the city hall of san boy de Obregat has to include uh, educational facets doesn't matter what the area is it has to have regard for uh, this transversal this uh, cross-cutting nature of education but at the same time in our city council we try to ensure that we have a local ecosystem, the local agencies, be they uh, schools, uh, be they uh, agencies pertaining to education, such as schools or other economic and social uh, stakeholders that are, may or may not be related to these academic uh, centers. As I say, this is a key role to ensure that all of our projects are educating projects. So those are the two main points, really. We're looking inwards and at the same time looking outwards and another point I wanted to stress in our um, frame of reference is the essential coordination between uh, strategy on the one hand, because uh, the paradigm of cities is strategic matter so far as we're concerned, but this is concerned, but this needs to be tied in with day-to-day -day life. And it has to be expressed in things that will have a concrete impact on the day-to-day -day life of our citizens in their squares, in their streets, in their homes, in their, in their public areas. Because that's where things take place, that's where things happen, and that's where things can be transformed in the public uh, area. So that's where we need to incorporate values pertaining to learning. And that's where uh, what we're doing in the area of education can become true and become real. Now, I want to tell you about this project, which ties in very much with the uh, cross-cutting, the transversal uh, uh, facet I referred to at the beginning. For us, education uh, for life is essential. We think that something that all of our citizens need to uh, incorporate into their learning process, however old they are, is values pertaining to peaceful, positive conflicts solving. We observe conflicts in our society. These may be large or maybe different kinds, but the point is how do we tackle these conflicts from a viewpoint of uh, rest, rest, restoring justice, always, of course, in, in peace. And we've set up a service that's linked to uh, community mediation, which has created learning spaces for these ways of approaching conflict. And since 2018, this has had a direct impact on more than 4,000 people, including uh, students, pupils, and teachers from primary and secondary schools, parents, and also community agents. We've worked on various 
methodologies both in the classroom and outside it so as to create these spaces where uh, people can face their problems tackle them and resolve them and resolve their conflicts and resolve their day-to-day -day difficulties in a different constructive way which will bring about positive links of trust among people that's one of the projects that we've been bringing online within the paradigm of educating cities but as i say it's also a matter of uh, community restoration and justice cities this ties in with the issue's slogan cities for peace and equal opportunities that's one project. So we have another one. And as I said earlier, we attach great importance to, to being close to the population, to working directly with the people and where the people are. And this has to do with our young boys and girls, our young people in the neighborhoods, to help them work on emotional issues. There's always been these difficulties. There have always been these difficulties, but we found that with COVID, uh, things have been more complex and tougher, especially for teenagers. So we've been working to palliate this impact of COVID and others by helping these teenagers to cushion these emotional impacts and thus also improve, uh, we're working to improve their opportunities because often we found that people's uh, thriving or not thriving at school ties in very much to their uh, emotional condition. Where the mm, adolescents are at emotionally has a great impact on whether they succeed or not at school. So we try to improve their opportunities in education by, as I say, palliating any negative emotional impacts they may have, for example, from COVID. There used to be a very high educational dropout rate in certain neighborhoods of our municipality, and these kids would be uh, on the street, they would be on the street and highly disoriented and be finding major difficulties when it came to locating a purpose in life and something to do. So through the team of professionals who've been working in the public space with directly with these young people, uh, this has succeeded in setting up a tremendous uh, 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 harmony between various generations. Among the generations, we've been able to work with these young people to help them face their situation, face the uh, negative emotional impacts they're suffering from, and thus work on improving their future. Now, I don't know how I'm doing for time. I think I had 10 minutes. Did I, Pau, do I have any time left? No sé, Pau, si tengo más tiempo. Yes, you did have 10 minutes. Oh, I see, so I've overrun already, have I? Well, we'll continue. Well, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for inviting me to take part, and I'd love to take any questions that there may be. Thank you very much, Luisa. Perdonar que pensaba que ahora hacía Marina y estaba aquí. Thank you, Luisa. Callado, pero Marina no la vemos, con lo cual le daré la palabra. Sorry, I was distracted, says the speaker. Uh, I can't see Marina. So I'll give the floor to Mika. To Karina Miklos, so that she can tell us about their project. This year's slogan was Cities of Peace and Opportunities. We wanted to hear two projects. One from each uh, to do with each aspect of that slogan, peace and opportunities. We've heard one now uh, uh, about San Boy's experience with a peace-linked uh, project, and it'll be a pleasure to hear from uh, Munich about something that has to do with opportunities. So you'll have it'll be a pleasure to listen to you for ten minutes, Karina. 
del apartado que está. Everybody, please bear in mind that you can ask questions on the chat, on the Zoom chat. Karina, cuando quieras. Karina, you have the floor. Thank you so much. I hope everybody can hear me very well. Um, it was very inspiring to hear my speakers before me, and it gave me a lot of key terms already how to start. Well, I'm going to start with introducing myself. I'm from the city of Munich, and I work for a unit called International Cooperation and Education, and it belongs to the Department of Education and Sports. Our goal is actually, you were talking about opportunities, Pao, so, but I also want to emphasize the peace part. I'm going to come to that later. So we want to give everybody the opportunity to have an international experience because we are very convinced that international experiences foster language skills, social engagement, democratic consciousness, soft skills, social responsibility, and self-confidence. And I'm going to come back to you, Valerie, what you said, and I really like that, the cluster of learners experience. We offer programs to students, but also to educators and teachers in the city of Munich with an emphasis on vulnerable groups. And our programs are personalized. They have to they have to really speak to the individual's needs. They have to be integrated in their learning experience in school. They have to be inclusive, meaning everybody should have an international experience. And that's why we focus actually on the on the vulnerable groups because people they can afford it, they go abroad and they but there are so many people who who don't have access to these programs. So re we really want to push those who would not usually have the access to, to be a part of our programs. And uh, they have to be relational so they have to relate to the programs what is their personal outcome they have to be social i will talk about that later and they have to be empowering and that's what i see in my work when i see the people coming back from being abroad they are more self-confident they have gained so much experience also for their whole future life so I said, I want to focus today on students and I want to um, emphasize some programs that we have. And um, one is called USA for You. It's a social community service for um, students in Munich coming from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds, meaning socially or economically, that usually wouldn't have access to these programs. They're um, like from 15 to 17. And it's this program is every year. It's fully funded by the Robert Bosch Foundation, by the Ministry of Economy and Energy, by the US Embassy, and also by the city of Munich. It's a social community program for two weeks. Uh, this year, it happened in uh, Michigan State in Ann Arbor. And um, it really fosters intercultural exchange, um, international understanding. These uh, students, um, usually, I would say that haven't had an international experience so far. Um, they stay in host families and um, the whole program starts with like an information evening. They get all the information beforehand with a whole weekend of um, how can I intercultural preparation? Also, what what will they be awaited for when they are in the United States? then the whole group already has kind of like group feeling if you want, and they all fly together to the United States and stay there for two weeks. And the program in the United States, it's framed with a, with living in the host family, as I said, with a sightseeing program, with an English course, and they are engaged in 
different um, social community programs. Could be a social project, could be animal protection, could be an environmental project. And afterwards, um, in Germany or in Munich, um, they are working with the skills that they have gained. So um, when I work with our intercultural trainers, um, they always say it's so enriching to work with the people when they come back. They have, they have gained so many, so many things. So, but, and now I'm coming back to empowering. We just had this group. I'm not the coordinator of the group. I just saw the pictures. These um, 15 uh, young people, they are awarded with a special certificate and a very festive reception in Berlin at the U.S. Embassy. And um, it's um, they talk to the mayor of Berlin and it's really, it's impressing. So my colleague said, to see what kind of change they have undergone during this whole program. And by the program, I'm not only meaning the, the staying in the United States, for example, but also including the preparational work and the work that has been done afterwards. So it has a personal, integrated and inclusive character. This is one of the projects. Another project that is done by my very dear colleagues, it is a project and maybe you've heard about it, it's called Generation Europe, which is funded mainly by Erasmus Plus Youth, um, by the uh, Erasmus uh, Youth uh, branch. And it's a multinational project to foster democratic citizenship. Um, Germany, um, meaning Munich, is working with a Polish and um, Spanish city, and it's also with a focus on vulnerable groups um, uh, to have young people interact in political questions, if you might say. And it has a focus on a regional, national, and international um, international work, meaning the, the young people meet here in Munich, the German group, or they meet in Poland, or they meet in Barcelona and interact in, in political questions. But also, um, as I said, um, they have a, a local level also. They could be concerned with uh, questions of human rights, for example, with uh, questions of migration, for example. Uh, the Munich group, for example, they studied a theater play. They did a theor theater play on, on questions of migration, for example. And also here you see, and I want to mention this as well, this year is the European Year of Youth. We have to give the youth, especially after COVID, we have to give the youth a voice. It's them who who are the minds of, um, of our future. And you said it very well, uh, Valerie. I was very impressed with uh, what you said. They are the one who have to thrive in a transforming world, you said. So what can we do? We have to send them out into the world to see something different, to get them out of their comfort zone and to... to to get to know themselves. And do I still have time, Marina? I'm, I'm not so sure. Okay, a few minutes left. Another uh, project I want, uh, want to mention, and I'm mainly engaged in that one, is uh, Erasmus Plus Vocational uh, Education and Training. Also, a lot of uh, young people from with vulnerable backgrounds and we work with a lot of networks to send everybody who wants to and who needs the opportunity we want to send them abroad to give them the opportunity to do an international internship abroad to get to know different professional backgrounds and uh we have to be interconnected and our economics are interconnected, but it's so much more than that. 
as uh, you said it earlier, Paul, in your introduction, I mean, Munich has a migration background of 50% of the population. So we are working with different migrational backgrounds and we, we need to get to know each other. So go out of your comfort zone, get international experience and yeah, thrive uh, in a transforming world. So I'm finished. Muchísimas gracias, uh, Karina. Thank you very much, Karina. And, uh, and, uh, and Luisa, I think uh, we've seen two practical examples of these ecosystems that facilitate educational transformation that Vadi was talking about. I really liked what we heard about what Luisa was saying at the beginning, that uh, we need to land in reality. We need to have our feet on the ground. We need to make this a reality. And we heard about all these different programs uh, from Karina. In Munich, there are very palpable, real programs uh, being set up in this educational ecosystem, and they give real opportunities, and they provide these opportunities to those who have greater difficulties in accessing them, so most, the most vulnerable populations. So, thank you very much again, and now it's time to open the floor to a debate. A través de las preguntas que ya han ido entrando. There have been a number of questions that have uh, come to us, and I'm sure that uh, further questions will uh, uh, will come to us, and I'm sure there's things you have left to say. Yes, uh, Marina, the chat has been very lively. We've received a lot of questions, and I'm trying to structure them and. Uh, 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 any question directed to a particular speaker will we'll do that. And, and there are also uh, a number of open questions. I don't know who would like to take the floor. Do any of the speakers like to take the floor? If not, then we'll move on to the questions from the public. Yes, yeah, so there's a question to Karina that's written in the, the chat. Would you like to answer the question yourself? To formulate the question yourself? Uh, I think it was to Valerie. Um, I think a lot of people... Um, a lot of people experience COVID in different ways. Maybe they were educators and um, were suffering from missing students. Maybe they were parents like me who uh, had students at home. I want to know, and um, I'm pretty sure you have an answer to that. Um, how do you think has COVID changed the purpose of um, education? No matter how often you do this, you still forget to unmute. Um, Karina, thank you very much for the question. And I was, I found what you had to say very absorbing. Um, I think there is one very direct outcome of COVID, which has been seen pretty much across the world, <clears throat> which is that educators have become much more alert to the phenomenon that Louisa referred to, which is the emotional background to learning and um, the understanding that emotional states hugely impact the capability of a learner to, to progress, um, to learn well, to change. And if that emotional stability is not there, then everything is really undermined. And I think that most of the educators I speak with will say that there is something called long COVID, not meaning the disease, but meaning the impact, particularly on young people, of protracted absence from school, mostly because of the protracted loss of activity and interactivity with their friends and with other peers. So the isolation, I think, 
um, impacted young people very much. And for some, let us be clear, living at home for in isolation in that period was extremely damaging because so many young people were in very unsuitable homes for learning, um, perhaps you know, sharing bedrooms, maybe only one bedroom, not having adequate technology, and in some cases, witnessing domestic violence or indeed experiencing domestic violence because of the frustration that many people from more disadvantaged backgrounds endured. So I think that emotional legacy is very strong. The second thing I'd want to say is that the educators, the teachers and the principals that I have contact with have a legacy of exhaustion. Um, most of them are what they call running on empty. Um, they're really, really tired <laughs> um, and have found it very difficult to gear up again to trying to um, attain a, a, a sense of energy and deal with all the multiple problems that they're facing with. I think one of the disappointing aspects is that when we saw technology being used much more flexibly and powerfully as part of everyday learning and thought that maybe that would mean that technology could be employed much more powerfully in classrooms, that has not often been the case. And too often schools have gone back to the old norm, which is very teacher centric, teacher lecturing, students listening, students responding to some questions, rather than a very interactive um, uh, and learner led approach. And indeed, because of this sense of quotes, learning loss, you know, students are behind what the students knew two years ago. There's this feeling they've got to catch up, got to catch up. And so some of the sorts of activities that you've just referred to in terms of overseas activity, outdoor education, um, particularly environmental learning in the outdoors has suffered because people have felt that they've really got to get back to the academics. And I come back there to purpose because if the underlying purpose is those you know, as I described it, all those assumptions about success um, rather than the broader, wider purpose, then of course that is what will happen. So that is the situation as I see it. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Valerie. Are there any other questions? Any other questions directed to the speakers? Uh, otherwise, we have a lot of questions ourselves. I'd like to ask Luisa a question, if I may. Yes, of course. Um, Luisa, I was very um, touched and impressed by the project that you described. Uh, again, going back to mental health and mental well-being. And um, I was curious about the kind of people who were working on that program. Were they youth leaders? Were they ex-teachers? Were they community members? In other words, how much was the broader community involved in engaging with young people who were suffering in that kind of way? And while you think about the answer to the question, may I also say I was very impressed by both projects um, focus on the underserved, um, because as you said, Karina, the wealthy or the well-off can always afford to go off to the States or to, to France or wherever. And, you know, going back to Luisa's point, the better off can, can find therapeutic solutions and ensure that their young people get back on track. The underserved do not. So I was very interested, Luisa, A, in the project and B, in who was involved in working upon it. Muchas gracias, Valerie. Yes, thanks very much uh, for the question, uh, Valerie. It's, a, it's great to, to be able to share this space with you and with everyone else. Uh, throughout the pandemic, right from kilometer zero, we were using webinars, uh, and then uh, we were, it was more face-to-face -face later. And throughout the whole period, we were working with all of those who work in the educating cities ecosystem. In other words, professionals, educators, 
y, uh, sobre todo son educadores Especially sociales, social educadores, uh, psicólogos, aquellos que trabajan en entidades en bodies. Bueno, son centros de como de ocio, so in, ¿no? in leisure centers, youth centers, centros de día, o sea, lo que son in day centers, those that are open, dispositivos para trabajar y acompañar a aquellos niños y niñas y chicos y chicas, como bien decías, children who, as you said, have certain difficulties, para seguir el para seguir el ritmo, who found it difficult to follow the education during the period, or those who work with vulnerable families, where education has been was undermined by the circumstances. And, uh, so we were constantly in contact with them to find out what was happening uh, to these children during the pandemic. And through this uh, permanent uh, contact, we're able to diagnose and identify a number of risks, uh, and one of the problems that we that kept coming up, and, uh, which we were able to discuss with all of these agents in the city, was the emotional impact that was very negative in teenagers. Now, there is a number of statistics that have shown that the uh, Emocionales the worst emotional impact was on teenagers. Now, that's very important. We really need to focus on that period of life because very often it's just, uh, you know, adolescence is kind of lost between childhood and, and, uh, and adult youth. And so it's sometimes forgotten about, but that's when young people take the most important decisions related to schooling, the, the first sexual relationships, decisions related to um, possible consumption of drugs, decisions relating to how they face up to authority and how they relate to their peers and authority figures. So this, there was a huge emotional impact at that phase of life and that generated a lot of suffering, a lot of pain. And there were significant risks, even in attempts uh, at suicide, uh, self-harm, addictions, food uh, disorders, social isolation. No, we really did need to intervene and we had to do something through public institutions. Because, as you correctly said, the families that have resources can find private therapy for their uh, children. But the families that uh, were less well off and more vulnerable simply don't have those resources. The public um, uh, health um, system, uh, mental health system, was completely overwhelmed. Uh, so, a child that was asking for an appointment and wanted to be seen by a public psychologist or psychiatrist was, were given an appointment eight months away. They had to wait for eight months to see a public uh, uh, mental health specialist. So, um, you know, apart from skills and resources, we had to prioritize this. This was so important to us. To, we had to provide uh, resources from the city hall, the municipality, and we received funding for an innovative project uh, in the, uh, uh, the Barcelona uh, local government, um, but also from the metropolitan area of Barcelona, because um, Barcelona, we received a million um, in funding for a uh, a plan for uh, for teenagers, uh, and this plan for adolescents included a free psychological specialized attention for uh, both at an individual level and a group level. And there were more than 500 uh, teenagers who were benefited from this plan, and so we had a team of five psychologists. They were young psychologists because we, we wanted to be careful about that. We didn't want it to be from a health point of view, more from a community point of view. So obviously these psychologists had to be uh, trained, but we wanted them to be closer in age to the teenagers so they could speak the same language, so they could understand the empathic and create a bond of trust. 
la atención no se hacía en ningún centro sanitario. And we didn't do it in health centers. We did it in community centers, places where the young people go to, in, in these uh, civic centers. In, um, the sort of youth centers, places where uh, young people go for other sorts of activities. And so we wanted to break through these barriers and prejudices. Now, it was very successful. There was a lot of demand for it, and, and there was very good feedback from those who uh, benefited from it. We weren't just working on, well, we weren't so much working on mental disorders, we were working on the emotional impact of uh, the pandemic. So we're not talking about specific uh, mental disorders. No, we, we were just, when we did find more uh, severe cases, we did actually refer them to the, the health system. But we wanted to look at the emotional impact, uh, conflicts that were arising, things that were um, upsetting their lives and helping them to get back on track. Now, I'm a clinical psychologist myself, uh, uh, as well as a, a mayor. Um, so um, I must say that I'm very proud of this program. I'm very proud of what Samboy is doing and all of the uh, ecosystem that's been set up because these uh, boys and girls are being involved in, in uh, public uh, uh, networks and um, we're, we're protective networks and that creates uh, greater safety, creates uh, bonds. And I think that we have uh, managed to um, manage a lot of these impacts generated by COVID. Luisa, thank you very much for underscoring uh, the importance of proximity, of working closely, the setting up of uh, close links, and uh, you refer to values such as empathy that play such a key role. And you can see the results really on the street, in the public area, that is. Uh, I don't know if there are any other questions among yourselves, one speaker to another, or if you want to wind up already. Bueno, bueno, bueno. Podemos ir intercalando, eh? Si después os viene. Of course. Um, but I just want to observe how, at one level, there's Karina working on global and global thriving. Um, is Luisa working on intrapersonal thriving and interpersonal thriving and both of those connect to the level of societal thriving i just think it's very interesting to conceive of our task as educators at working at all of these levels and being assertive that this matters assertive that this is incredibly important and not i mean in a sense what we're trying to do is bring into the core of learning and schooling things that were on the periphery, on the outside, and make it clear that this is really the purpose and the rest will follow. So I just want to under, underline that, I think. Super. I was also very happy to see that uh, there was a, a big, big connection between your presentation and, and the four levels you mentioned and their presentation. So uh, thank you for uh, for bringing this, this issue up because it's it's very interesting to see the connection that we're not talking in abstract, but we, we are. Uh... Karina. I just want to mention that now throughout the conference and to what you have all said about education, education is not simple. It's so multi-layered and we really have to bear in mind, to really have an approach to all these layers. And if not, we just leave our kids behind. So we, as I said, I was really impressed with uh, with your cluster, cluster um, Valerie. And I think a lot of schools still have to follow this and to really bear in mind that it's not just a teacher who is in front of the class and who has a textbook and just reading and making them write a test. It, education is so much more and it's not just happening in school. That's why we have informal learning and that's why we have all these different approaches and programs. So there's 
still a lot of us all, I think, to learn about education. And I have a question um, now that I'm speaking. Do you have an example of a school that is already following all these um, all these principles that you have mentioned? Yeah. Thanks for the question, Karina. Um, so in my book, what we have done is to upfront set out the rationale for the design principles. And by the way, I do think design principles are a good way into this because it's no good saying to schools, you've got to change, you've got to transform. And they go, how do I start? Where do I begin? You know, And you can do it in bite-sized chunks. You can take pieces of the puzzle um, and, and work towards something different. And what I, what I want to stress in answer to your question is that the design principles, and there are 14 of them, are not a recipe. They are the ingredients. And so it depends what kind of cake you want to bake or what kind of meal you want to cook. Um, and so what we have done throughout the book, there are multiple examples of schools right across the world, from New Zealand to Finland, you know, everywhere, um, is take examples of schools who have selected a, a, a collection of the design principles and combine them for their kind of overall driving purpose. I mean, I would say that some of the design principles are always present. And one of them is from that cluster around values, which is being explicit about purpose, because so much from that flows. And if you read the book, you will find that some of the schools in there are really intent on attacking some of the big challenges that humanity faces. For example, just let me give you two examples. One is the green schools. So there is a green school in Bali, Indonesia, in Mexico, and in New Zealand. And their big mission is to say, look, unless we have young people who don't just get sustainability, but who have, have a completely different relationship to our natural world and understand how we have to change how we relate to the natural world. We are finished as humanity. So their whole purpose and, and focus is on young people who become environmental champions. And they have selected their design principles from the 14 that I've mentioned to enable that. You can imagine what some of them are. Relevance is huge. Um, empowering is huge, um, but that's their selection. There is another sort of archetype of schools who are intent upon what we've called ethical leadership. And their, their belief is that in this world of ours, there's a real deficit of great leadership. And their intention is to enable young people to think about what it is to be a leader and acquire the competences of leadership. The school that we give as a big example of that is called the Liger Leadership Academy. It's in Cambodia, a country, of course, with a terrible history of civil war, uh, a bloody history, um, where they really desperately need new civic leaders. And the, Li the, Li uh, the Liger Leadership Academy is also spreading, and you find lots of these in the US as well, who say, actually, we need young people to understand what it means to be an ethical leader who can connect up the dots, who can make sense of things, but who can understand the values that are needed for a good public life. And so again, you can imagine the set of design principles that they select for that purpose. So I say again, the design principles are kind of like the ingredients and educators combine them to the particular purpose that they have in their culture, in their context. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Valerie. Uh, we also believe that uh, there are not two cities alike. Every city has its own history, its own uh, local forces. And um, so the implementation also of the principles of the charter varies from one city to another. Thank you for reminding us that this happens the same in schools and communities. Um, now I would open uh, I would open the space for 
questions from the audience. Let's see what comes first. Okay, aquí Here's a question for Valerie. For Valerie. Local governments that don't have direct competence in the education system, how can they make a contribution to this new ecosystem when they're not responsible for education? Yes, of course, but I mean, that, that is making a narrow definition of education. They may not have competency in relation to what schools teach and learn, um, but they have a broader capability, I believe, precisely to create the ecosystem. And the examples I've given you of um, uh, Remake Learning in Pittsburgh and Educatio 360 in Barcelona um, have local authorities who are not running schools, but who are directly involved in saying, to quote Powell again, it's everybody's business. So where are the resources for learning? And I don't just mean informal in terms of, you know, informal courses or adult education courses, but within businesses, um, within civil society. Uh, I think it was Karina who mentioned internships. The creation of internships across all facets of society is an incredible learning resource. So I believe that local authorities whether they do or they don't have responsibility for schools, do have a responsibility to create thriving communities. And that depends upon creating an ecosystemic approach to learning, certainly in partnership with the schools. So I believe that there needs to be a really significant dialogue between the schools and the local authority about how, if you like, the walls Bit of the schools can be made more permeable, can be can be taken down, and the schools seen as really part of their community and not separate from it. And then, secondly, I think that what and you know, if I if I were a mayor or if I were just sort of catapulted into working in this field, I would be putting people on to creating an audit of all the multiple ways in which we could contribute to a learning ecosystem in partnership with the formal system. I would be identifying philanthropists and funders who could bring extra resources to the party. I would be getting people to research all the fantastic examples. You can start with my report if you like, or there are, you know, as I've given two, two websites of organizations who have studied learning ecosystems, getting to researching what they look like elsewhere and say, hey, we can do that. So I finish, on the note that I finished my presentation with, we can do this. We know how to do this now. We can. Thank you, Valerie, for reminding us of this. Many of the educating people here do carry out such maps so as to see how our links with environment are working and to bring about synergies. So it's always encouraging to uh, hear that we're going down the right road and that uh, local governments don't need to be responsible. They don't have to do everything when there are other protagonists in the environment who are doing these things been sufficient to support them and um and often adding two and two you can make eight mm -hmm. a question in french for luisa could you tell us about the impact of the policies that have been set up is it possible to measure that impact the question refers to the policies uh, applied in san boy do you have any assessment of them, reply. Yes, of course, we have a system of qualitative and quantitative integrators. The quantitative ones, of course, refer to the number of people who have been who have benefited. This uh, project was based on six free sessions for teenagers over the age of 12. From 12 to 21, in fact. So one indicator was how many people applied for the service. It's very, very important to see how many are applying for the service, which can then be provided directly or through the family. 
it's very important to note whether the uh, adolescent may applied direct or via the family that's very significant whether they finished the uh, number of sessions or if there was a dropout rate and of course after that the end assessment of course at the end of the whole process with the professional there was an assessment carried out of how useful it was felt that the process had been and whether those involved felt that they needed more uh, more sessions more assistance to get over their, their um, troubles and whether to refer them to other things in the public sector where there might be support systems and there was also the interesting factor of going from individual work to group work because of course there are groups and networks for psychological psychosocial support working with various kids who had previously gone through the system of individual one-on-one -on -one sessions we're still finishing the evaluation of this in fact this project was brought online at the end of 2022, says the speaker. Perhaps she means 2021, because she's added just now that it's not been a full year yet. Perhaps in 2023 we can carry out an assessment. But uh, this ongoing assessment and the provisional results from that have been as follows. This has been useful. It's been very widely appreciated by those involved and by their families and by the education systems because we've been able to establish links and relationships with the, with the adolescents uh, assent of course we've established links with their teachers for example and we've been able to see that uh, there was parallel improvement between their competence uh, at school and uh, their uh, social skills that we were working on. So we have this ongoing assessment, it's not finished, and of course, when we carry out an overall uh, analysis of this, that's something we want to do at the end of the calendar year, and of course we'll let you know the results, we can let you know no problem. Marina, thank you very much, thank you, well done Samboy, another question here, another question from Munich. How are the young people selected to take part in these projects? What criteria are applied for the selection of them? Okay, for the vocational training, for the Erasmus uh, specializing in vocational training, what are the criteria? It's actually not grades. So we don't want to select by grades. Um, I have never said no to anybody because most people that uh, want to apply for an internship, they have the motivation and they really want to go. And so that is the criteria is their motivation and their will to go abroad. For the young people, since there's Usually the groups are for about 15 young people. Um, my colleagues would probably answer this better than I, but I will try. Um, they also have to write a motivational letter. So it's motivation and it's maybe also social engagement if they have been socially active uh, before. And it's also not great. So to make it available to everybody. Mm -hmm. Yes, and motivation is very important. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? I see this is an open question. Do you think that the shared experiences between Samboy and Munich can be easily applied to other cities? What has made them successful so that they can be replicated? Perhaps, Karina, uh, would you like to answer that question? Hmm. Let me think about it. So 
What I haven't mentioned is that we are a body within the Department of Education and Sports, and we have a municipal education system. So we kind of work as a satellite serving all the schools. And since it's a municipal system, we are close to the teachers. We are close to the schools. It's not a, well, in Germany, you have the lender the different regions who are responsible for the for the education but here it's really the city who is responsible for um for the schools so the the part i work in is called service um advice and funding so we really give advice to the schools. We really go into the schools. We advise them on, on how to do their international and European projects. And also with the with these special programs I mentioned earlier, like um, USA for You and Generation Europe, we have a system, Marina is probably familiar with it, it's called Local Education Management Centers. And they these are centers, and we have talked a lot about um, environmental clusters and clusters in regions also. These are centers in, um, Valerie called it, in underserved uh, regions or more disadvantaged advantaged, uh, regions. It's it's very it's very simple. You just go in. It's like a like a shop. You go in. If you have a, a demand on education, you you can enter. If you're from zero to ninety nine, you want to know how to apply for a job. You want to inform yourself about education. Um, you go in. You ask and. There are people, uh, social pedagogues and so, like specialists in education that can help you right away without an appointment. And I think that's important. If you don't really speak the language, they have brochures and descriptions of education in, in a lot of different languages. So they can really help on the spot. And those are the centers also that foster our programs that are in these centers where are the disadvantaged schools or the schools with more underserved students um, with a more difficult background maybe. And those colleagues go into the schools. They talk about our programs and that's how we, how, how we get the people, how we, that's what I said earlier. I mean, education might not be simple, but it has to be simple to, to get. You know what I mean? So that's how we would do it. And um, yeah, how can we replicate, have satellites, have people that go into the schools, that multiplicators? Yes, uh, thank you, Karina, for reminding us the importance of the, the proximity of these centers. They're very, very close by, uh, very close to where the needs are. And uh, uh, the mayor talked about creating this bond and creating this complicity, trust, and uh, this is something that we can see is very useful. So, uh, mayor, uh, how do you think we could extrapolate from the Samboy uh, experience to other municipalities? Oh, I, I think that everything can be extrapolated. All of these projects can be transferred to other areas. You just have to adapt them to the local realities. They have to be customized. It also requires all stakeholders to be involved. When we talk about local ecosystems, of course, they're different depending on where you are. But this needs to be set up jointly at the same time. Now, I do think, yes, that the projects are transferable. They're universal. The emotional impact is universal. Emotions are universal. And it's been shown that these impacts occur everywhere. Now, there's cultural differences, there are social differences that might uh, introduce uh, um, certain uh, differences and, and, and it can also open the door to different ways of managing them. But this is something completely universal and cross-cutting, education. 
por suerte existirá siempre. Estamos emotions are universal as well. It's common to all humanity. They've always been there. And we're talking about emotional pain uh, when difficult things happen in life. And so this is a universal as well. So of course, yes, it can be transferred to all different circumstances. But there's something very important. That is skills. Uh, I mean, city skills have different powers. We, um, we've got different priorities. Now, the public uh, system needs to establish their priorities. These priorities need to strike the balance between strategy and everyday realities. If there's any kind of mismatch, then it would be difficult to, to really transform things. Now, we're always talking about the SDGs, uh, the 2030 Agenda, now, what's the 2030 gender about? It's about a generation. It's about you know, kids who are 12 now who will be 22. 15-year-olds will be 25. Those who are 20 will be 30. So it's about the generation, the young people of the city. What are we going to improve? And what are our priorities for investing in, in improvement in the lives of these young people. So we're talking about political and institutional values uh, for public policy, for local ecosystems. And yes, this can be transferred to anywhere. Look, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we have uh, a, a final minute, uh, Valerie. Anything that you'd like to, to say uh, just to wrap up? Remembering to unmute. Um, no, thank you for the opportunity. I'd like to thank the interpreters, uh, whose job is enormously difficult, and I deeply appreciate what you've done to try to make it intelligible. I hope I didn't chat too quickly. Um, give my huge respect to my other two panelists for the work that they're doing, and just say, you know, gracias a todos. Well, well, thank you. Uh, we thank you from the association. We thank you for the, the time you've devoted to this. We know that you have a busy schedule. So thank you for sharing all of this idea with us. And uh, now we're going to uh, close this, uh, this session. So we have our uh, 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 delegate here uh, from the, the Barcelona City Hall, uh, Pau, and you're going to close the session. Yes, thanks very much. Before we Finish. Uh, yes, there's a lot of uh, questions on the chat. I haven't been able to read them all, but there was one specific question here from a father from Barcelona who sends us uh, warm salutations to uh, Manuel and, uh, and the, talks about a very severe case that uh, was experienced firsthand. And we need to... Uh, have a, there's this apotheosis, this technological apotheosis, as Valerie calls this. Uh, now, that, um, now, this has brought great things. Uh, it's uh, uh, allowed us to, to vaccinate very quickly, but it's also brought things that are, are terrible, such as cyberbullying. We also need to think about digital rights of children and young people uh, and in social media. And the educational system needs to help to manage this. And there's large technological corporations such as Google and others that uh, um, have, you know, possession of, of all of this data on our young people, and that's, that's a very sensitive issue. Now, we didn't have uh, time to really discuss this uh, issue, but I'd like to, uh, you know, greet uh, Manuel. And also, I'd like to th thank uh, uh, Valerie, uh, um, Marina, and Karina for the, everything that you've said. Uh, it's been a really interesting debate. We've managed to really discuss this in a, in a, in a calm and uh, collected manner. But we've also talked about the specifics uh, and how this can really be implemented at a local level, as uh, Mayor Luisa was saying, or Karina's examples as well. 
Karina says something which I think, think is essential. It's not uh, this year's motto, it's yes year's uh, motto, but we, we, we have to work on this or we'll leave people behind. We really do need to, uh, to adopt this approach. And then there's this uh, global intrapersonal, interpersonal dimensions. And we really need to prioritize those who are um, less, uh, less well off, otherwise we're going to leave people behind. And uh, now for the, the mayor, uh, you, now, if, uh, as you correctly said, if the children and young people uh, aren't well cared for, uh, psychologically, then there'll be problems. Now, uh, they need to, to flourish, uh, as Valerie said, uh, that you can't progress and flourish if you're not uh, in good emotional health. So I'd like to thank all three of you and also thank you, Marina, for moderating the, the debate and all of the team in the association who've uh, organized today's meeting. And as Valerie uh, said, I'd also like to thank the interpreters. Uh, we've got so many different languages uh, in our organization. It's a large organization. And so we'd like to thank you for the, the invisible but essential work that you do. And of course, uh, I'd like to thank the three panelists, the technical team, and all of the cities who have uh, represented today and who've spent time with us. I am also convinced that this project uh, can be transferred to other cities and to other circumstances. And uh, the idea is to take the best uh, elements of uh, projects that have already occurred and to adapt them to new circumstances. And with this conviction, we'll continue to... Uh, to learn and, and share our experiences. Tomorrow is the, the big day. Uh, this is, uh, and we hope that it's very successful. And I think to close, we have a, a little video and uh, this is what we're going to end with. Thanks very much to everyone.